Welcome to our fourth video on our sequence on international macroeconomics. In this video, we're going to discuss the small open economy model of an endowment economy. Before going forward with the topic, I want to remind you all that you can listen to this video at a higher or lower speed, depending on the way that you feel more comfortable in studying. Okay, let's get into it. First, some background, and the background for this is going to be chapter 9. I actually really encourage you to go back to chapter 9 before going into this topic. So the model that we have based on the one in chapter 9 is a two-period endowment economy. What does that mean? There is a representative consumer and a government. They both live for two periods. What they're going to do in these two periods is they're going to consume, save, charge taxes, have spending. The key in this model is that consumers get an endowment of output, output every period. This is going to be called Y and Y prime. Y for current period, Y prime for the future period. The key here is we're not modeling where production is coming from. That we're going to do in a future model. This is going to allow us to focus on the way they are consuming and saving. Now, what makes this economy open? What makes it different from the economy in Chapter 9? Well, it's a simple thing. Interest rate is given by the international interest rate R star. That's going to imply that this economy actually works exactly like the partial equilibrium version of the model in Chapter 9. The bond market need not clear precisely because of international borrowing and lending. If there is the need for additional saving in the economy, they can save by lending to other countries. If there is a need for additional borrowing, they can borrow from other countries. So the bond market need not clear. Now, a quick note, I recommend reading chapter 9 until the definition of equilibrium. The reason for this is, as I was saying a moment ago, all the model we're going to do, it's really similar to the way the model in chapter 9 works in partial equilibrium. So this is just the start of chapter 9 up until equilibrium is defined. Okay. Let's go on into our consumer. There's going to be a representative consumer that lives for two periods. The consumer is going to choose consumption, that is consumption today and tomorrow, CNC prime, and savings. These are going to be the private savings of the economy. We're going to denote SP. If SP is negative, that means that the consumer is borrowing. So there is no sense in which they have to be savings. They can be borrowing. The consumer stake is given the endowment it gets, Y and Y prime, the tax that it has to pay, T and T prime, and the interest rate, which we're going to call R star. The star stands for the international market interest rate. The objective of the consumer is going to be to maximize utility. So here is the problem. Consumer is choosing C, C prime, and savings to maximize the utility of consumption and future consumption subject to the present budget constraint and the future budget constraint. In the present budget constraint is the same as we've seen before. All expenditure, consumption and saving, disposable income, Y minus T. Future consumption is equal to disposable future income plus the returns on savings. If saving is negative, then the consumer is borrowing. This is a cost the consumer has to pay and this is additional income the consumer gets. Without any financial frictions, we can actually join the two budgets into a lifetime budget constraint, where on the left-hand side, we have the present value of consumption, and on the right-hand side, we have the present value of income, which we also call lifetime wealth. So this side here is what we call lifetime wealth. Let's see what the optimal, uh, what the optimal decision of the consumer is. So we're going to have a diagram. This diagram is taken from chapter 9, where the consumer is going to choose optimally consumption in this point D by equating the marginal rate of substitution between consumption today and consumption tomorrow to the marginal rate of transformation in the market of consumption today to consumption tomorrow given by the interest rate. That point is the point of tangency between the indifference curve and the budget line. This budget line is a lifetime budget constraint that we derived here at the bottom of the previous slide. So that's going to be that blue line. An important thing is this point E. That's called the endowment point. And it's always part of the budget constraint because the consumer can always choose to neither borrow nor save 
so it consumes disposable income today and disposable income tomorrow. Now, given some interest rate, that's going to set the slope of this, of this line, then we're going to get exactly how much consumption the consumer wants. Now, an important thing is that once you see the graph comparing consumption, with the endowment point tells you if the consumer is a borrower or a saver. In this case, we have a saver because consumption is lower than disposable income. Remember that savings are equal to disposable income minus consumption. What about the government? This government operates for two periods, just like the consumer. Uh, it sets taxes, taxes today, taxes tomorrow, and chooses public debt. Now, remember, public debt is nothing but the negative of public savings. So in models, we generally talk about these as B, where B are the bonds of the government. But because we've defined everything for the current account in terms of savings, we are changing here the notation for the public savings. We're denoting it as SG instead of as debt B. But you can see how you can go back and forth because they are just the negative of one another. Now, the, the government has to set these taxes and this debt so as to pay for government spending G and G prime. And of course, the government takes as given the international interest rate R star. The budget of the government we've seen before. So the present uh, period budget is gonna have government spending G plus the government savings equal to the amount of taxes. And in the future, we're gonna have government spending equal to taxes plus the returns on the savings. Of course, if the government wants to borrow, it can, just has to set SG to be negative. Now, the same as before, we can join these two into a present value budget constraint for the government with the present value of government spending being equal to the present value of all taxes. And then we define the government savings as what is left of taxes, net of, and this is a typo, this should be a G. I'll fix that in the slides I'm going to post. Now, in the equilibrium, we're going to have a nice set of news. Actually, two good news. The first one is there is no need to clear the goods market in this economy. The reason is international trade. In the closed economy, we have that consumption plus government spending needs to be equal to output today. And in the future, consumption plus government spending needs to be equal to output tomorrow. But in an open economy, we can use the import of goods if we want to consume more than whatever output we have. And if we want to consume less, we can just export those goods in the international market. So we don't need to clear the goods market because it's going to clear through imports and exports. In a similar way, we don't need to clear the bond market. We already alluded to this a couple of slides ago. In a closed economy, we needed to find some R in equilibrium such that the net amount of savings is equal to zero. So bonds or savings have to be zero because every time somebody is saving, it has to be borrowing to somebody else in the economy. So total savings have to be zero. In an open economy, this is not so. Because the interest rate, it says by the international markets, this is the R star we mentioned before. And so if we have total national savings that are negative, agents can just borrow from abroad instead of borrowing from one another. If national savings are positive, then agents can save abroad. Now, what about the current account? As we said ago in, um, uh, actually in video two, the current account is deeply related to national savings. What we saw in that video is that the current account reflected the domestic demands for goods and funds from abroad. And we had current account equal to private savings. That is, current account is equal to whatever is out of output after you've consumed and the government has uh, made the expenditures it needs. And we can see here that in this case, the current account is exactly equal to net exports. So if the country is saving, if national savings are positive, there must be a current account surplus. Also, there is a surplus of goods because there is less consumption than there is income. And the surplus of goods, it's going to be reflected in exports. If the country is borrowing, then there is going to be a deficit in the current account. 
but also there is going to be more consumption than production. That's basically what it means that total savings are negative. This is going to be met by importing goods. So here we can see the important role of the current account in helping the economy accommodate its needs for saving or borrowing. If the economy wants to consume more than what it's producing, it can do so by importing and borrowing from abroad. Those two things go linked. If the economy wants to consume less than what it's producing, it can do so, but it's going to have an excess supply of savings that it can send abroad, and it's also going to have an excess supply of goods that it can also send abroad. So that's going to be the link between savings and the current account. With this, we finish this video. In the next video, we're going to study some comparative statics of this model, basically what happens in the small open economy endowment model when we change, say, the global interest rate or income.